were traveling through Sant'Angelo in Vado, in the region of Italy called Le Marche, and we're heading towards La Metola. Margaret was born in 1287 from Parisio and Emilia of Castello della Metola, which is up there. They were very excited about having an heir, and they were hoping for a boy and for a, for a, a child to leave eventually one day the property. And uh, when the, the child was born, however, the child was crippled, was blind, was hunchback, was deformed. And they were very shocked and surprised and disappointed and, and ashamed of the child. And so Margareta, Margaret, Margarita lived in the castle for a few years, but then she was brought down here in this location and she was kept away from the castle. Churches were utilizing art to communicate what saint was worshipped in the church. Uh, to do so, there was a symbol uh, associated uh, with the uh, saint. For example, um, St. Francis of Assisi is portrayed with the stigmata. In this case, Blessed Margaret was portrayed with a heart with the sacred family inside. Thank you. 
follow me. We're finally on top of the tower, uh, Torre della Metola. We waited a few days to be able to come up here because we had very cloudy and foggy days. But finally today, uh, the weather allowed us to walk all the way, actually climb all the way up here and um, get on top of the tower. As you see, the view is breathtaking. And this is the home of Parise and Emilia, who uh, were the parents of Saint Margherita of Castello. She was born right here. This is a very old um, structure. It's even uh, portrayed in the Vatican uh, maps. And this is a postcard. Uh, you, you can see that the view allows you to see what's going on all the way from Rome to the sea. And uh, it goes back to the Middle Age. And again, this is where she was born. And uh, sometimes uh, this structure used to be under attack. And that's why people tend to believe that St. Margaret was kept a little bit far away because being so physically challenged, she was very vulnerable. So uh, some people say the parents were embarrassed. Some people say it was also an act of uh, protection towards her. But this is where uh, she is from.
So we're getting close uh, to um, moving on uh, with the journey of uh, St. Margaret um, heading towards the town of Mercatello. But before we leave this place, uh, I would like to introduce a, a station of the cross Via Crucis, um, realized by the local um, uh, chapter that devoted to uh, Saint Margaret, and uh, with me here is Rosella. You've seen her, uh, her walking me uh, through uh, the the, the um, uh, church and 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 the, uh, all the way up to the tower. Um, but uh, the reason why Rosella is here is because I would like to ask her and understand more why and um, why she she made this rosary and how she came up with the shape of the daisy thank you eh, si può dire che è nato tutto da un sogno eh, premetto che avevo una zia non vedente e alla sua morte mi aveva dato un piccolo regalo come aveva dato anche ad altri nipoti e io questo, questa, questo regalo lo volevo dare in beneficenza una cosa magari inerente anche a come era lei non vedente. Un giorno ho fatto un sogno dove era coinvolta la Santa Margherita, precisamente eh, la sua medaglia. E praticamente eh, avendo avuto anche dei segni dopo questo sogno eh, ho capito che questi soldi li dovevo destinare a lei che era cieca, anzi era la patrona dei ciechi. Quindi mi sono indegnamente eh, messa in questa strada per realizzare qualcosa per lei, ma non solo per lei, perché volevo fare un qualcosa che era sia per lei che non vedeva, quindi compresi tutte le persone che non vedono, sia però anche per chi vede, perché eh, lei non è solo per la gente che ha delle disabilità, perché tutti noi al nostro interno abbiamo qualche disabilità. E ho deciso eh, di fare la sua medaglia dentro una margherita, e, quindi volevo fare una cosa che era bella per chi eh, vede normalmente, però anche funzionale diciamo per chi non per vede, chi non that's, vede that's very e, e quindi poteva sentire associare a lei la medaglia della Beata Santa Margherita a lei. Ecco. That's very nice. Sì perché anche nel sogno io avevo visto un cuore con dentro il presepe e lei nel cuore aveva la Sacra Famiglia quindi l'ho messo anche nella medaglia perché è il suo simbolo la Sacra Famiglia nel cuore. With the rosary is also available the story of uh, Saint Margaret in Nero Braille. So one more thing I want to say that this uh, a group of uh, uh, devoted um, uh, community, right, or devoted uh, citizen here, local, have created and sponsored the uh, Via Crucis, si. the, um, the Station of the Cross. And uh, the, the verbiage is written in every station, so if people forget uh, the words on how to uh, pray uh, the Station of the Cross, they can just come up here and read it, so they don't have to carry anything with them. They can just come along and enter the journey and uh, get closer to God. Well, thank you very much. Thank it's you. a very interesting, <laughs> fascinating story. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So we're in front of the church now. We're about to enter this beautiful church, which is called Parrocchia di Santa Veronica Giuliani, another extremely well-known uh, saint of the 1600, who was born also here in the Mercatello sul Metauro. And why Mercatello sul Metauro? Because La Torre della Metola, it's under the city 
of Mercatello. And La Torre della Metola that we just visited is where, in 1287, Margherita was born. Uh, she died in 1320 in Città di Castello, which we're going to go to see next. And uh, although she was known up until always, she was known always as a Blessed Margaret, uh, so although she was known even in the United States and in the Philippines and all over the world, uh, she was only canonized by Papa Francesco, by Pope Francis, on April 24, 2021. So she finally became a saint after 700 years. She is the saint of the blind people and of the unwanted or outcast. So it's a very interesting story and it's getting more and more interesting. And we're going to find out now why uh, her iconography is the heart with the Holy Family inside. Follow me inside the church. So now we're entering the church. And our first focus is going to be the baptismal font where Blessed Margaret was baptized. Uh, yes, because she was baptized here in Mercatello, su Metauro. The interesting thing is in 1600, this town also uh, saw the birth of Santa Veronica Giuliani. And this is also the baptismal font where Santa Veronica Giuliani was baptized. So this town was blessed with two saints, one extremely well known, and one, Santa Margherita, who is now starting to be more and more uh, known all over the world. So over here, we can appreciate the rope, the original rope of the saint. And then next to the rope uh, is the uh, statue uh, portraying Santa Margherita holding the heart with the Holy Family. So the story of the heart with inside the Holy Family um, will also uh, take us to the next step, which is um, Città di Castello. Because while she was uh, in Città di Castello, where she lived uh, outcasted, um, and abandoned by her family, and then we'll go to that story later, she kept telling people that she was not alone because if people could only see what she was holding inside of her heart. So when she passed away, because she was saying that over and over and over, they uh, inspected the heart and they found there were three like pebbles, three stones with uh, the images of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. And that's why her iconography is the heart with the Holy Family. We're going to see now the original painting that was, um, uh, that is reproduced in many of the uh, images uh, representing Bless Margaret. And is also uh, in the uh, centerpiece of the rosary that we saw uh, earlier. And this painting will connect us to uh, the United States because there is a copy of this painting in Ansonia, Connecticut. So we're going to see now the original and then we are going to see in Ansonia, in Connecticut, the copy. So, and here we are uh, looking at the original painting that uh, has been reproduced in many of the devotion images. It's beautiful, <laughs> it's old. And again, the heart.
Plauso US uh, journey is about to conclude for the Italian side of the story of uh, Saint Margaret of Castello. We are finally now here in Città di Castello in Umbria and uh, this is where the uncorrupted body of the saint lays inside the church of San Domenico. So come with me inside, we're going to see uh, and uh, meet uh, Saint Margaret of Castello. Come with me. We're finally here inside the church of San Domenico, next to the altar where uh, St. Margaret uh, remains lay. She's an uncorrupted body. And uh, welcome to here to welcome us is uh, Father Tonino, Father Antonio. Si. So we would like to ask Father Antonio about some information of uh, the life of uh, bless Margaret here in Città di Castello. Nice to meet you, Father <laughs> Tonino. Siamo in un anno particolare perché è l'anno centenario della morte di Beata Margherita della Metola, Santa Margherita da Città di Castello, così come è, è stata chiamata dopo la canonizzazione. Questa è avvenuta in modo così pubblico, con concorso di tanta gente, il 19 settembre di quest'anno. Quindi in questo momento noi siamo nel luogo dove è stata non solo custodita per sette secoli, ma anche onorata questa persona piccola, malata, ma il concia proprio, dove la natura ha messo proprio poco, ma la grazia di Dio ha messo tanto, che l'ha resa importante e significativa per sette secoli. E il luogo dove lei è riposa e viene onorata è la chiesa di San Domenico, perché lei appartiene a questo ordine religioso come laica, terziaria domenicana. E, e, e si è ispirata alla vita di San Domenico per la sua santificazione. E lei riposa qui e viene onorata qui in questa chiesa. Una chiesa costruita in onore di San Domenico, di questo grande patriarca, che è ricordato eh, come colui che annuncia, difende, protegge la fede cristiana. E, e la testimonia con la vita 
ma anche con la luce della verità che lui predica. Per cui l'ordine religioso che fa riferimento a San Domenico sono i padri predicatori. E quindi si comprende perché il disegno architettonico di questa Chiesa, che lo ricorda, è particolare. C'è una grande aula dove si insegna la dottrina cristiana. Una grande aula di lunga 65 metri, larga 24 metri, alta altri 25, no? E che è un monumento d'arte. E questa aula è anche il luogo della presenza di tante opere d'arte che lungo il tempo l'hanno abbellita e l'hanno arricchita. La vicenda di questa chiesa è una vicenda del tutto particolare perché nel 1860, con la soppressione degli ordini religiosi e la confisca dei suoi beni, è stata anche... Eh, il momento in cui tante cose si sono sparse per il mondo, si sono perdute, però nel 1920 una persona chiamata Faeti eh, ha riportato questo luogo nelle forme che erano originarie. E quindi siamo in un luogo in cui la, la, la grandezza di Santa Margherita viene onorata anche dalla bellezza del luogo. Very interesting. Perché eh, la fede non è soltanto una cosa profonda, grande, una cosa bella, importante, ma anche una cosa bella che deve piacere. Ecco, ecco perché la bellezza dell'esterno è anche la bellezza dell'interiorità. Benissimo, very nice. Okay. Santa Margherita, okay. Beata Margherita, è conosciuta un po' in tutto il mondo, e dovunque l'ordine domenicano ha portato la sua presenza. È presente anche Santa Margherita. Nonostante la pochezza della sua realtà umana, però la grandezza del suo esempio, l'emozione che suscita, perché da tanta cosa povera nasce tante cose grandi, è nata, ecco, ha fatto di lei l'immagine di, di coloro che, attraverso pochi mezzi umani, ma sostenuti dalla grazia, riescono a fare cose grandi e che durano nel tempo. Questa è Santa Margherita. E quest'anno veramente lei, in modo particolare, è stata messa al centro della preghiera, ma anche della ricerca intorno a questa figura qui. È patrono dei portatori d'handicap di tutti coloro che fanno fatica e che richiedono da parte di noi cristiani, in modo particolare, attenzione e carità. Ci auguriamo che la sua devozione, la conoscenza della sua vita, diventi anche per tutti coloro che vedranno queste immagini eh, un modello di vita, un esemplare da seguire nella vita di fede. E della storia della Santa a Città di Castello, ci sa dire qualcosa? Dunque, lei nasce a Mercatello, da una famiglia un pochino importante, ma non è, no? Che si aspettava l'erede, quindi un maschio, e una persona che continuasse la, la, la vita di questa famiglia. E invece è nata una femmina e, e malmessa, perché cieca, stoppa. Eh? E questa famiglia, invece di celebrare la bellezza di questa vita, si è sentita quasi umiliata, tanto da nasconderla. Poi crescendo, la cosa non è stata potuta nascondere, no? E quindi hanno sentito dire che a Città di Castello, da dove abitavano loro, la Città di Castello non c'era una figura di un francescano morto, Beato Giacomo, che godeva la fama di santità e quindi anche la capacità taumaturgica. E questi genitori hanno preso questa bambina e l'hanno portata alla tomba del Beato Giacomo a pregare. Ma 
non è avvenuto nessun miracolo, no? Il miracolo è venuto con la vita di questa persona che l'abbandonarono, ma è nato il miracolo della carità di chi l'ha vista, di chi l'ha incontrata, di chi si è commossa no? della sua vita e l'ha accolta. E gli ha permesso quindi di vivere. E fra coloro che l'hanno accolto delle famiglie di Castello, ma soprattutto anche l'ordine dei Domenicani. Lei ha potuto vivere la sua vita, lunga quanto è stata lunga la vita di Gesù Cristo, e quando fu, quando è deceduta, che è morta, hanno detto come tante volte diciamo anche noi, santa subito, non bisogna seppellire dal cimitero, ma dentro la chiesa. E lei è rimasta nella chiesa qui vicino, e quando poi fu costruita nel 1400, questa chiesa, poco dopo, fu portato dentro questa chiesa, in un altare che adesso non c'è più, poi messa nell'altare centrale. E quindi la sua fama qui, a Città di Castello, è di una persona conosciuta, conosciutissima, amata, ma però viene sempre chiamata, anche se lei è al titolo di santa, Beata Margherita. Beata Margherita. Vuol rimanere sempre piccola. E il suo corpo è intatto, quello che è sotto, è stata fatta la ricognizione. E speriamo che susciti dentro di noi una capacità di capire che la vita umana può essere significativa in ogni condizione. Esatto. E... Che cosa ci sa dire della, della simbologia? Perché il cuore con la famiglia, uh, con la sacra famiglia dentro? So what I'm asking, Father, is to explain why uh, the, symbo the, the, um, uh, the symbology of uh, uh, the iconography of uh, Blessed Margaret is the heart with the holy family inside. Diciamo, Beata Margherita o Santa Margherita come c'è qui, assieme a Caterina, a Santa Caterina, e anche eh, una figura di San Domenico, è raffigurata con in mano il presepio. Il presepio. Lei quello che ha nel cuore e quello che ha nelle mani è la famiglia del presepio. Eh, fate riferimento che Beata Margherita vive più o meno negli anni di San Francesco, San Domenico, 1200, 1182, 1226, nei 1320, per aiutare i cristiani a capire il mistero dell'incarnazione, che Dio della fede non è il Dio su nelle, nei cieli, ma anche qui in terra, che si fa carne e nell'umiltà della carne. E San Francesco ha creato il presepio. E il presepio è l'immagine della concretezza del mistero dell'incarnazione. Cioè per dire che Gesù, Dio, si incontra dentro le persone. Very nice, Father. <laughs> so she is the saint of the unwanted and of uh, people bearing, carrying handicaps. And um, so there's a very fascinating story. There's not uh, much known about this uh, saint. And through the heart, we started this journey Uh, to try to understand why, you know, this, this uh, uh, blessed Margaret was portrayed and it's, uh, there are art uh, representation all over the world. And now we know that she's uh, a very, uh, she has a very interesting uh, story. And, uh, and thank you, Father.
We are here in Connecticut, Ansonia, United States. As I was stating while traveling in Italy, um, this is the copy of the painting we saw in Mercatello sul Metauro. Um, the copy was made by Ettore Di Giammarino, an Italian artist, and, um, and it's here in this chapel because here in this community there is a group, a prayer group founded um, to worship uh, specifically uh, Blessed Margaret, St. Margaret, to ask for her intercession. And this prayer group meets once a month and we're going to meet them uh, later uh, because they're going to be meeting today. Now we're going to meet Carmen, one of the members of the prayers group uh, of Ansonia. Carmen, can you tell us how it started, this prayer group, and can you tell us a little more about, um, about sure, it? Sure, sure. Um, it started with uh, Father Jim Sullivan um, when he came to our parish. Um, he is a very devoted to um, St. Marguerite the Costello. Um, at that time, when he came to us here, um, uh, we, Marguerite Costello was not a saint, um, so we started praying for her to become a saint, to be canonized. And so every month, once a month, uh, a few of us meet here in this chapel, and uh, we say the, the rosary, the entire rosary. Um, we usually have a picture of her relic here, because Father Jim Sullivan is no longer with this church. He's been transferred to another church. So we made a copy of the relic to have with us, so we feel the connection to her and also to Father Jim Sullivan. And so we have the rel a picture of the relic here with us, um, just to keep her spirit here with us alive. Very well. Thank you. Very interesting. You're Thank welcome. you very much, Carmen. Normally, uh, uh, L'Applauso uh, tells story about the artist or about an art technique um, that has to do with Italy, but also has some connection with the United States. In this instance, it's the first time we discuss the subject of an artwork, uh, the subject of a painting. We tell the story of the saint uh, because it's an interesting story and because also there is an interesting involution in the art iconography representing uh, St. Margaret. And so for the final part of this uh, um, story, we're going to be meeting Father Sullivan. And Father Sullivan is in Waterbury, and he's going to tell us more about why uh, Blessed Margaret, now St. Margaret, is a very contemporary uh, saint. So come with me to Waterbury to meet Father Sullivan.
it in Faber Sullivan. And welcome to the beautiful Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. Hello, come Father. On come on Thank in. you. We're looking forward to showing you all about Blessed Margaret. So we're here in Waterbury with uh, Father Sullivan. Uh, Father Sullivan, let me give you a little bit of background of why uh, I am making the story of Blessed Margaret. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Italy, I filmed all her story, and um, of course, for transparency, I am a devoted of Blessed Margaret, and I've known about her, but um, when I came to the United States in this area, and uh, I saw that uh, there were a uh, prayer group uh, that were founded about Blessed Margaret. They yes. were founded to pray bless, for Blessed Margaret interception. Yes. Um, and then uh, one day I happened to see uh, this painting. Yes. And then this is what uh, made me want to tell her story. Yes. Because uh, coincidentally, it's a very different. Uh, Iconography, it's an interpretation of an artist. It's sure. a very different iconography from sure. what uh, was she was represented up until now, at least in, in Europe, in Italy. Yes. And, uh, and uh, um, I would like you to tell us why Blessed Margaret became saint after 700 years and why she's such a contemporary uh, saint and what is this all about? Sure, I should probably back it up a little bit Absolutely. by explaining a little bit about my devotion. I, you say you have a devotion too. So my devotion to Blessed Margaret started 1995, right about there. My uncle was a Dominican friar. Of course, Blessed Margaret was a third order Dominican. And one of the priests who had a relic, a first class relic of Blessed Margaret, in fact, I have it here with me. When he died, my uncle knew that I had already had a devotion to Blessed Margaret. It started a number of years earlier. I was in my early 30s. And when I heard her story, it just touched my heart. And I began to pray to her and just learn more about her. There's a beautiful book, several books written about her. I read the one first by Father Bonnewell, the Dominican friar. And so my uncle gave me this first class relic of Blessed Margaret, now Saint Margaret. And it's a piece of bone. And because her body is incorrupt, I probably have one of the few in the world relics of, of St. Margaret of Castello. So that's my desire. And so back in 2016, I think it was, yes, went to Italy, and to my surprise, our tour director, who's a friend of mine, her and her husband, after visiting Assisi, basically said, get in the, get in the taxi. I said, where am I going? You'll be surprised. So then she told me. And we went to Blessed Margaret's home you know, the, the, where she was, and the, the castle, and all of that, and I said, well, wait, I've got to get a chalice, I've got to get a patent, I've got to get a host, who knows, maybe I'll be able to celebrate Mass there. So we went there, found the family, went to the house, and I celebrated Mass. And the people that, from, who owned the property, they said to me, now, I don't know how they would know this, but they said, you're probably the first priest ever to celebrate Mass in English, in Blessed Margaret's wow. cell. So that was just so touching to me, you know. So I don't know how true it is, but I like to believe it. Maybe it is. <laughs> you know? so it, but anyway, that's my love. And then as a priest, I met this artist. His name is Paul Armesto. He was doing some work at the, my previous assignment, which is about 15 miles south of where we are, at a town called Ansonia, Connecticut. We were there. We became friends. And he drew this painting as a gift. Total okay. surprise to me. So obviously it's now St. Margaret of Castello, blessed in her Dominican third order habit. There is some artistic license. Would you like to hear that now? Or Please, I continue? think that's yes? very interesting, yes. Okay, if you tell us, so yeah. Blessed Margaret, St. Margaret, has I think been considered by many to the patroness of the unwanted. Because with all the medical technology today, ultrasound and all these other things, if she were conceived today, very likely she would not have made it into the world. She would have probably been aborted. And so, look what God did with her. Yeah. Despite her infirmities, her, her lacking physically so many deformities, 
all the blindness of being lame and the crippled and all these other things that would, would hurt, destroy many of us in our spiritual life. She actually came so close to God. Wow. And so it, we see here in the painting the child Jesus holding really an aborted baby. You know? Wow, okay. And so it is a powerful image. We have the angel crying. We also have the daisy. You know, I prefer you... Margherita, yeah, yeah, because in Italian the Margherita yeah. means daisy, and yes. Daisy. So the artist in his interpretation has a daisy springing forth through rocks, through rocks, through the, the crevice, mm -hmm. symbolic of future, of life, of hope. A woman like St. Margaret gives us hope. Yeah, you know, she gives us hope. Whatever good. happens, the struggles and trials in our life, wow, we say, look what she did. Look what God did through her. Through her. And it gives all of us hope. And she had so few physical gifts, but yes. she was a completely gifted spiritually. Like God, completely yes. gifted spiritually. And all the, everything that happened in her life, uh, the parents, the abandonment, and the, 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 the living homeless, and, and all of these other things. By the way, she might also be considered, <laughs> in a certain sense, the patrons of the homeless. Because she was herself, she was a beggar. Could as do. we all know. That's true. That's but the I story. think it could be Chittani both. Castello, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, that's my connection. But wow. in this trip to Italy, when we went that day, uh, we went to where she's buried. Of course, her body, and I celebrated mass in Città di Castello. Yes. yes. That portion is also being filmed in this. Uh, uh, yes. yes. So it was afterwards. I called it one of the greatest days of my life. One of the greatest yes. days in my life was celebrating Mass at the yes. altar of St. Margaret. I will never forget that day. Wow. There are certain days in our life we don't forget. Right. That was one of the days in my life I will never forget. Right. Yeah. So very powerful message, very, yes. very powerful saying that after 700 years she's been canonized, right? Yes. Yes. Only, only last year. Yes, only last she's year. She's been Beata up until now. So. In fact, with COVID, the only priest, the only saint in 2021 to be canonized wow. was St. Margaret wow. by, by Pope Francis. More, uh, yes. Wow. Can I share one other little story, personal story? Please do. Yeah. So I'll share with you something very personal, a story um, that's very meaningful to me. Absolutely. Uh, we're in Waterbury, Connecticut, in a beautiful Basilica of the Immaculate Conception. It's actually the home of Blessed Michael McGivney. Oh, wow. So he's a founder of the Knights of Columbus. He was born right down the street. This was his parish. In oh. fact, this is our 175th year, 1847 to 2022. So for years, the former pastor here, Monsignor Bevins, he had prayed that Father McGivney would be beatified. So this year, 2000, late 2020, he was beatified. Oh, Within that wow. same year, Another priest born here at the Basilica, his name is Father, Th Father Thomas Conway, went down to the U.S. into Indianapolis in 1945. He received the Navy Cross. We've been striving for decades for that to happen. So these two beautiful things happen here. And then for me personally, the third one. Wow. Blessed Margaret being, after 700 years, canonized a saint by Pope Francis. Wow. So for me, it was like a trifecta. <laughs> for wow. our parish, it was a trifecta. Wow. Because our parishioners, we're, the, where we're standing now is the, the, the McGivney Parlor. It's, a, it's where we meet people at the Basilica. It's a, it's a main room where just people come in and we greet people. And so, so many people ask about this painting because of its beauty, but also its profound meaning. Sure. And so I share with them. So a number of our parishioners are also uh, acquiring a devotion to St. Margaret because when you hear her story you can't help but be moved but just for me personally this year three things mm -hmm. Blessed McGivney, Father Conway both here born at the Basilica and my favorite saint it means that God is really listening to your prayers <laughs> oh I guess so you were all, with, yes. all within I never thought this would happen in my lifetime wow never thought it would happen wow. well after heard, 700, yeah, 700 years 700 years you might figure that's it right. but there was a lot of people who were really striving and praying to have her canonized. Her, Margaret's story has, has spread in any number of ways. The prayer group that uh, a group of us started in Estonia, Connecticut, people praying once a month there. Yeah. Um, her story is so compelling, especially in today's day and age. Right, very contemporary. Yes, yes. 
and the human person today is looked at in a diminished sense. The body, you know, the person, when in fact every person, no matter how we're born, we all have great dignity in the eyes of God. Blessed Margaret, Saint Margaret, is the model right. of it's God's It's almost love. like God chose Blessed Margaret to dignify all the physical yes. handicaps and physical, you know, to dignify all the yes. uh, people carrying uh, physical challenges yes. and also being homeless and also uh, showing that God can do a lot with a life uh, if we give it a chance to be born, right? I see a very sad uh, guardian angel here, or yes, an angel. What yes. is the story about the that angel? That is my understanding. Never from seen the, a sad angel yes, before. Yes, right. right. So uh, the, the angel is, is, I assume, weeping over some of the things that are happening in our culture today. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the cheapness of human life, mm -hmm. the, the rampant use of abortion. Um, just, is, he, is he the guardian angel of the? That I wouldn't know. Right. Yes, I wouldn't know, but I. I think it's probably just symbolic of the angel of, of so many. Of so many. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. But God is joyful, and there's always hope, as we said, right. even in the daisy, yes, coming, yeah. coming, th coming through the rocks. But the she's rocks. a saint for our time. All right. She's a saint for our time. Cool. Yeah. That, that's a very fascinating yeah. story. That's a very fascinating story. Well, By the way, and I see... Oh, yes. Yeah, so you were no, going no, to I was say that. Say, yeah. I, even the, the artistically, the, um, the hinges and the shape of a cross... Yeah, and the seam and the halo. So the halo and the hinges match each other. Okay. But yes, the artist, by the way, had no idea what Margaret's house looked like or the palace. Oh. This was when he painted it. I may have shared that with him. Right. And this is, for those who may have one day go there, as I was, that is the proper dimension. The castle is that distance away. Okay. And this was the window. And so I'll share with your listeners one thing I did from the United States when we went over. I brought maybe a thousand prayers. All the parishioners put them in, uh, and I tightened them up and folded them and made them tight. And when we were there, we, we dug a hole right where that angel is, right outside that window, dug a hole right outside Margaret's window, buried all those prayers, blessed them with holy water, and prayed that God, through the intercession of St. Margaret, answer those prayers according to as well. So that's just a beautiful thing that no one would know except those who were with me on the trip. Wow, very yeah. interesting, yeah. Father. Well, thank you very much. Yes. It's, a, it's a beautiful story. Can I please ask you also to share with us the, the relic of... Yes, of course, yes. So this is probably my prized possession. Again, it was given to me in 1995 by my uncle, a Dominican friar. One of the priests had died. This belonged to his possession. And he gave it to me, and knowing that I had devotion. So this has been close to me in my bedroom for the last 27 years. Wow. And I often touch and kiss it. And wow. also have other people do the same. Yeah. At the prayers group, we saw that they uh, have a picture of this uh, um, uh, relic. Yes. And uh, they, you, they bring it out when they yes. meet to do yes. the prayers group. Yes. Well, in, in Scripture, we, we see uh, relics being, um, and in the early church, of course, relics have always been a sacramental, you know, something that uh, we have a devotion to mm -hmm. because they point to God. Margaret never pointed to herself. None of the saints do. Right. They all point to Jesus. Right. And one more question. She yeah. was so um, strong in her religion, and yes. that's because when she lived in the little house, yes. they say that the... A priest was taking care yes. of her, right? Yes, and he yes, taught yes. her all the scriptures yes. and he taught her all the prayers. So yes. she was a, yes. a knowledgeable uh, right. person. Right. And she memorized it all. That's right? right. So she had a lot of deformities, of course, in her body. But one of the two gifts God gave her in particular. One of those gifts was a loving heart through every trial. Mm -hmm. But secondly, incredible intelligence. Right. Yes, she had all 150 Psalms memorized. Wow. And just a little lesson to all of us, but in my brother priest, too, in the event that there's a priest listening as well, I always say, God's big on the little. Right. God's big it's on beautiful. the little. So, it might, be, it might be a temptation not to spend as much time with the Margaret. Oh, spend, spend more time with the, the more um, uh, illustrious people in the parish. 
you know, the more influential people. And there might be temptation not to spend as much, not to visit. No, we visit, we visit the Margarets. We visit the Margarets because God can do great things with little, with little and make profound miracles for the entire world, right. as was the case with St. Margaret. Right. Yeah. right. Well, thank you very much, Father. It was a very interesting story. And thank hopefully you. Uh, the whole world will uh, get to know more and more of Blessed Margaret. I enjoy being with you. So now we are here in, uh, again, we're still in Waterbury, and as you heard before, uh, Father Sullivan uh, was talking about, the, was explaining the iconography of the painting, and he said that uh, the artist took some licenses and interpreted uh, uh, the, 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 the portrait of Blessed Margaret in a different way. Well, it just so happened that today, here in Waterbury, we have visiting the artist. So, we're going to meet him now, and he's going to uh, uh, tell us a little quickly about him, and then maybe we can ask you to go and see the painting of Blessed Margaret again. Absolutely. Okay, so yes. you introduce yourself, please. <laughs> My name is uh, Paul Armesto. I'm a classical artist. Uh, I was born in boulogne billancourt right next to, to Paris, and, uh, and I've been painting since I was... Three years old, so... Wow, so I see Father Sullivan is keeping you pretty busy here. Yes. Okay, maybe absolutely. we'll come back another time and, and get to know you as an artist. But for now, can we go in, uh, uh, in front of the painting so you can explain to us what the iconography is? Uh, Gladly. Are? Gladly. Okay, well, follow us. We're going to go back to in front of the painting of Blessed Margaret, and we're going to have the artist tell us why you chose certain symbol and why you chose to represent her this way, which is very different from how she was represented up until now. Absolutely. Follow me. Follow us. <laughs> well, we're here again at the beautiful painting of Blessed Margaret, and I'm, I have the privilege of being with the artist who happens to be visiting Connecticut at this moment. And uh, so, Paul, you know, you know that this is a Blessed Margaret, now St. Margaret was a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. my favorite saint for the last almost 30 years and as a gift to me which i will forever be grateful for you gave me this gift as a complete surprise mm. about a year and a half ago and well maybe obviously blessed margaret saint margaret was a third order dominican but maybe you can share with us some of the images here that inspired you to to paint it the way you did there's some very unique images here of course christ uh, holding the fetus really and, and, the, and the guardian angel well maybe you can just comment on that some of the things as you felt inspired as you painted this beautiful painting well it's really a painting about uh, a value in life right mm -hmm. valuing uh, what's uh, it's hard to put into words which is why I painted it <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but um, well the idea is that the, uh, a baby, uh, life is a miracle. It's not something to be taken for granted. Yes. It should be valued. I mean, uh, the conception and the, the whole. Uh, I mean, it, it reminds me of when I had my, when my wife was pregnant, right? I mean, that was a whole miracle happening in front of me. Yes. So to treat that as as nothing, I, I find that. Uh, uh, you know, it's like, like what Jesus said about uh, not giving pearls to the to the swine. Right? Yes. I mean, you have to value the beauty and value the the miracle of life. And uh, I didn't want a painting that would be judgmental, but I wanted a painting that would be about um, being sensitive to that. To, to that. So, uh, so you want to tell us a little bit about the painting? Absolutely. You want to explain the details? Well, pretty much I think the painting, um, I mean the idea of, a, of this kind of painting is that pretty much it explains itself. But So here you have uh, Jesus 
as an infant, you recognize Jesus by the halo and the cross on the halo, right? And the, the traditional colors, the, the red and the, the white, the red symbol of his passion and the white of his purity. And he's uh, portrayed there as an infant precisely because it's, I mean, it links to, to uh, the image of, of the fetus that's, that's been sacrificed. And why did you uh, have him uh, next to Blessed Margaret? How do we know that that's Blessed Margaret? Okay, and well, what we, is know, that? we can see that, uh, first of all, she's blind. You can see also that she has a kind of... Uh, a hunchback? Hump. Yes, a hunchback, yeah, yeah. Deformed. Also, she's got uh, a cane, the, the cane uh, to help her walk, right? So, so those are some of the symbols. Then the, her traditional symbol that I inter I've interweaved mm -hmm. in, into the painting with the, the heart and the three pebbles. Now, I didn't want like the typical, uh, I didn't want like an, an icon image where she would be holding the heart, but I wanted the symbol to be there, mm -hmm. so I worked it in, in the painting. So she could still be identified, but it was yes. uh, not as obvious. Yeah, so, so her, her, her symbol is there, but it's not in an icon, uh, uh, as an icon. Right? Then there's a tower of Metola, so that's another symbol that's there. And uh, also the river, the river, which is a symbol of, uh, of the afterlife, oh. right? So, so Christ, the idea is that Christ, as you can see with the little cloud, Christ is like coming to get the, the little fetus, right? Oh. To take him to the afterlife. Oh, okay. Right? And there's uh, the guardian angel here. He's in sorrow. He's, uh, because he feels he has failed in uh, his mission. In protecting right? the fetus. In protecting the, the fetus. So... Wow, very powerful. Yeah. Well, wasn't there something too about the broken glass? Said, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you see a, I mean, um, if you see a, a broken window, what's you, you feel like there's a, there's been some kind of violation, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's like the the womb the womb was broken, right? There's been mm -hmm. there's been an an, an attack. And you know, like sharp edges makes you, it reminds you of, you know, of what cuts, right? I mean, to 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 kill a fetus, it's actually quite cruel, right? So the the instruments they use. So uh, 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 the idea of broken glass conveys that idea. It conveys that something was violated, something was something is wrong. I mean, if you go by. A place with a broken glass that you you get that that feeling that either someone went in there, violated the the property, right? Mm -hmm. So there's so there's all, all that uh, psychological uh, message that that symbolizes. How about symbolized. Two, all about the, the daisy coming out of the stone? The daisy, of course, the margarita in, uh, in Italian means daisy. Okay, the daisy is in uh, religious art in biblical art. It's a symbol of uh, innocence and fragility, so uh, it, it shows the idea that the fetus, which is defenseless, I mean, he's, he's or she's def defenseless, the defenseless and vulnerable um, uh, against adversity is, has been um, sacrificed. So the, the idea of the little daisy being, being in such a state, stepped having been on. Yeah, stepped on or trampled upon, yes, mm -hmm. uh, has, um, reinforces the idea. Some other symbols, some other symbols that you can find in the painting are, for example, her crutch, which is the, in the form of a, what's called a tau cross, a cross in, in the form of the letter T. So she's like holding her cross, right? Another one is like the labyrinth, the, the, all these stones, which is like, reminiscent of life, right? That life is like a labyrinth you go through, right? And you just have to hope you get through, I guess. So, um, there are many, 
many uh, symbols there that uh, reinforce the idea of uh, the importance of of life and uh, it's the miracle of life and um, one thing I, I'll add is that uh, one of the challenges was to paint this dried eyed I mean uh, very often I'd be so moved uh, to tears by the, the theme that I'd have to pause to paint this mm. because um, I myself I'm a, I'm a father and uh, I mean uh, I believe in uh, that uh, when you're having a child, that you know, the child is counting on you, mm -hmm. right? The child is counting on his parents to for protection. Yeah, the child has the whole world against him or her, and he's counting on his mother and his father, mm -hmm. and uh, to be rejected by those who made you. Uh, I, I, I can't imagine such a, a it, it must be painful, very painful. And uh, so that pain that, that she expressed, uh, that, that she lived throughout, throughout her life, uh, she was able to turn it into love, which is that, I think that's a, another miracle. Mm -hmm. right? She was able to channel of that pain and instead of being resentful she she turned it to, turned that into love and, and i think that that's one of the messages that uh, should be brought forth uh, nowadays if we keep uh well i think i'll stop it there okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Very moving painting and this is what inspired me to want to uh, tell the story and find out more about the subject of the art. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, you know, in the old days, I started this video by saying that in the old days, churches utilized uh, art to show to the, uh, to the people what, uh, what, who, which saint was worshipping that particular parish. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we don't need those uh, vehicles anymore, so art is really uh, taking a different um, uh, you know, purpose. And I think this is probably, for me at least, the first experience that I've seen such a reinterpretation of a 700-year-old a, a, a uh, saint, a 700-year-old you know, person that lived 700 years ago, and you made it so contemporary. And this is why I decided to learn more about who she was. Yeah. So thank you very much for this inspiring. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Artistic and I thank you for the opportunity to to uh, to explain all this to to the viewers, world because hopefully a lot of people are going to see this. So thank well, you very much. Thank it was you. a real pleasure meeting my you. My pleasure. There is one more person I want to introduce you, and that's uh, Aurora uh, Delaney, and we're going to meet her in church in a minute. Come with me. <laughs> and we are now at the end of the story about Blessed Margaret. And we're here with Aurora Daly. And uh, I would like to ask Aurora, uh, when did you uh, get to know about Blessed Margaret and what's the story with her? Okay, um, I've heard of Blessed Margaret through Father Sullivan, who was our pastor in Torrington, Connecticut. And there he's told her story at least a couple times when I was there. Anyway, um, he had Led, no, he's part of a pilgrimage to Israel uh, when he was just ordained. And at the end of the pilgrimage, I told him, Father, our next pilgrimage should be to Italy. And then he said, that sounds wonderful. The only thing is, if you could please find a way for me to get to see Blessed Margaret's incorrupt body at Chito de Castel. Because he's very devoted of, of, of the saint of blessed, oh, bless, then blessed Margaret. Blessed, yes, yes. I said. When, what year was that? That was um, 2015. Okay. And, but to plan it, you know, you need a year. So I so said, the trip was actually in 2016. Yes, okay. yeah. And it so happened after that, we heard that it was going to be the Jubilee of Mercy. Oh, okay. So I said, perfect. So that was the plan. So here I am planning this 
pilgrimage uh, all over Italy, but my main goal was to find the right time for him to go to Cita de Casal. It's not a natural part of the tour, so I had to find this uh, just the right time for it. So, um, so that was in Torrington. So in the midst of planning, he got called to Ansonia for his first assignment. Mm -hmm. So here I was, he goes, oh my God, it's like, he's going to move to Ansonia. What's gonna to happen to the pilgrimage? Well, we just trust in God's plan and said we're gonna continue no matter where he is. So while in Ansonia, uh, I was planning this trip and I met this lovely couple, Silvana and Frank, and they wanted to go on this pilgrimage. But that time was already sold out. So I said, I have to put you on the wait list. I said, no problem, we'll do that. So okay, but in the meantime, she spoke fluent Italian. So I, in my back of my head, it would be lovely for me to have this wonderful couple on this trip. So I started researching online. I, I put in Blessed Margaret of Castello, and after a while, it just goes back. There's no more pages to look. And I was a little bit getting frustrated. So I started praying to Blessed Margaret. I said, okay, you know, your favorite <laughs> priest wants to see you and I'm having a hard time. So I woke up one night and said, oh my God, I am going to use her Italian name. So I put Beata, Margherita, and all of a sudden, this whole world of information showed up. Very fascinating, very fascinating. Yes. So you were able to organize the trip, and Silvana and yes. you said Silvana and Frank. and Frank helped you out. Yes, okay. and because there was a cancellation, and they were able to come on the trip. Ah, oh, great. Okay, yes. Again. So, so <laughs> Silvana jumped in. He said, "Okay." We're gonna, I'm gonna help you look for this because all I found were all in Italian. And then one of my research, I came across Metola. Oh. And I said, oh my God. I said, I'm not gonna tell father about this part because this is it. This is where she grew up. She, yeah, and she was born too. Yes, she was born yes. She grew up until she was yes. a teenager, yeah. So, so uh, that part of the story is like, okay, now, so excited. Silvana helped contact the priest. Father Tomino, so we, that was moving mm -hmm. along. So we had this all this trip, uh, his side trip planned. Then as we were getting close, it was in October. Uh, it was the we picked the the Marian Jubilee of Mercy. So what happened is everything was just going too smoothly. The planning I said there must be some kind of hitch somewhere. <laughs> so that summer. Um, Fa father's mother's health suddenly declined. So, oh, okay, so to the point that it was almost, he might not even make it to Italy. Oh, so you had organized everything, it was just good to go, and then maybe yet he was close to, to possibly, possibly cancel. canceling. Oh, yes, okay. so, so what I did is, um, at that point, I addressed Blessed Margaret, Margarita, you know, he was like a friend. They said, we will have conversation. He goes, okay, so what are we going to do? You know. So uh, you start talking to Margarita. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So <laughs> how are we going to resolve this? And, and you know, uh, this could be a touch and go. And knowing how father felt about his mom and everything, it was touch and go. But I said, you know what? Here's what we're going to pray. Either you help and intercede and get her healthy and then he's got a peace of mind of if it's her time and everything just call her immediately so there would be no question and as father said his mom passed away just before we left but he oh. made the trip he he had to he did not fly with us but and he gave up his time to see the pope but he made it to Rome the next day. Oh, so, so he didn't live with you, but he left the day after, and he joined the the, the tour. The tour, and he was able to to, to continue, continue on. on. So in my head, okay, this still works. We could still make it because we had planned the his visit when we were in Assisi. That was to me the closest, largest town we were going to be in. 
that's closest to Chita and Metola. So, so at this time, Silvana had reached out to the family and, and Father Tonino, but your, to the family the, uh, that owned the, the Metola, owned by Metola, I okay, believe, so. uh, yes, okay. and uh, but they kept saying, you can only visit if it's a beautiful dry day because they were going to go up these mountains and the roads are just not paved. And, and so here we are approaching Assisi and it was like, doesn't look good. It was bad weather. It was yeah, raining. bad. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> bad, bad. Like, okay. you know. so, the, so the time that we woke up, though, everything was like, oh, my God, it's going to happen. So we had the tour of Assisi, and at the end of the tour, the rest of the group went to uh, visit uh, St. Clair, and I said, Father, you're going on a special trip. Oh, and what did you say? So said, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on? And we had a van. You know the beautiful things? Mm. The name of the driver was Domenico. Oh, yes. like the Dominicans. Yes, yes. So all these little things go, okay, all this right. is going to happen. And so the driver was... Uh, knew the place and everything, so they brought him there. So you, the way you organize, you, you organize a separate tour for him? Yes. So you hire a special van? A van, yeah. And then private. some of you left? Yeah. And what, and what, what did you do? What, what did so, you say? So, right. so, so he, he, with him, I, I sent him with Frank, all guys, because I, I knew it would, he, where he was going was be physically demanding. So it was Frank. Sylvanas' husband, the deacon who was my who would help, you know, my conspirator at that time, <laughs> <laughs> and then the driver. Mm -hmm. So while they were doing that, I completed the tour with the whole group with the intention at the end of the day we were going to celebrate mass at Chita de Casello with Blessed Mark. With Blessed Mark. So what what happened during the tour? Uh, the, oh, their tour? Oh. Yeah. You know about it? Or <laughs> oh, uh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Again, oh. Father Sullivan had more, more stories, uh, but they had shared some photos. But the funny thing that happened is he, Father Sullivan is 6'4", I believe, or 6'5", somewhere there. He's tall. We got the, to the place in Metala, and all they had were rubber boots for Small feet. <laughs> oh, okay. So I heard that when he found out he was gonna go to the to where she was born in in Metola, and the audience already saw the Italian side. Um, he was very excited. He, he prepared to celebrate. Mass oh again, yes, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. Right. So so we were at the end uh, uh, in Assisi, and we could still see the church, the basilica. So I told him, he "Goes, Father, we're going to do this." Oh wait, wait, wait! I need to buy a chalice. I need to bring host just in case I get to celebrate Mass there. So I talked to the driver, okay, we have 10 minutes to, to, to buy all these things. So Father runs to the, the Basilica so he could buy the host. <laughs> Frank was looking for wine, you know, water. and water. Oh my and gosh. And right? Yes, yeah, oh yes. Which and, I'm and, hearing we're gonna see next, yes, right? Because yeah, he, he, he kept his... the, the, the chalice and he brought it over here. Yes. And he uses it every day, right? It's his right. daily chalice. Right, right. At the basilica, yeah. So it was just so uh, he was able to uh, climb up there, right? And, and, yes. the, and the audience saw already where the where the church uh, is. It's a very small church, in you know, in the mountains, in yes. a very uh, not easy to reach <laughs> yes. spot. And he was able to celebrate mass there, right? Yes, it was. And so I, I think that some of you said that he probably, most likely, was the first priest to ever celebrate mass there in English. In English, so that's a such a fascinating story. I'm falling more and more uh, for this uh, Saint Margaret. Oh, she's been, um, just just a lot of coincidences, right? But yes. a lot of which coincidences don't exist. So it's, uh, it, it, I don't believe in right. coincidences. It's always there's a purpose for that. Right. And this one for him, it was meant to be, and just how I found all this information online and. Mm -hmm. I'm quite certain. I address her not as Margaret, but an Italian name, Margarita, because Margarita. that's how I became close to her. And even now here, when there's some issues, she goes, okay, let's see. <laughs> well, can you help me or <laughs> whatever? But I really address her as Margarita. Again, you know, this story, it's about getting to know Margarita. And uh, she um, is a... a 
um, a saint that was, you know, she's a, 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 a person that lived, you know, in a different era. And so, uh, you know, after 700 years, she became uh, canonized. And, yes. And there's, it's amazing how, you know, 700 years ago, she was born in Italy, and uh, 700 years later, she's canonized, and she was from this very remote, you know, place in, in the mountains of the center of Italy. And then now she's uh, known all over the world, right? Because we're here in Connecticut, still talking to her. And still, yes. Like she's just a contemporary, right? So yes, this is yes, a very yes. fascinating story. So thank you, Aurora. Thank you, everybody, for watching. We're now at the conclusion of this story of Blessed Margaret. I hope you enjoyed uh, coming with us through Italy, uh, through Ansonia, and, uh, and here now in Waterbury in Connecticut. And uh, hopefully this story will inspire you also to make your own trip over in Italy and here in Connecticut. And there are many other prayers groups all over the world that are devoted to Blessed Margaret. And uh, hopefully you continue following us here on Applause US and see you next time. Thank you for watching.